I'm really excited. I'm not sure if anyone got to see uh, the women in the, the woman in the red boots. Well, now you're going to see her. So Jacqueline's going to come up here again. The question: What makes you cool? She says first, you know, I have made a product that is going to change virtual reality. I have made a collar that can be controlled in an augmented reality space to actually produce <laughs> sense. You could smell a, a VR world. You could smell it when you're inside it. So I think Jacqueline's good. And by the way, she you, did you walk here? Jacqueline, you could walk here, right? You got dropped off because she's so close. She didn't deal with any of the traffic. She's here. So let's present to our next speaker. Jacqueline, I, I don't have your last name on here. Jacqueline? You don't have last name. I like it. Jacqueline is here. Let's give it to her. Working. Okay, everything seems to be working. Yes, my last name is Maury, as there it you. says on the uh, on the thing. But I'm not going to talk about the scent collar today. Um, so you can catch me afterwards to to talk about that. I'm going to talk about virtual humans and avatars. Is this sound okay? It seems like yeah. Thanks. Okay, so. This is a little bit of the agenda I'm going to talk about. Um, at ICT, where I work, the Institute for Creative Technologies, we make virtual humans. We're also putting them into uh, not only virtual reality applications, but virtual worlds. Yeah. Um, so I'll talk about a couple ways that we have actually used uh, virtual humans in the virtual worlds and then a little bit about future work and talk about collaborations. So as I said, ICT makes virtual humans. We make them for all kinds of applications. Uh, we have them where you can negotiate with them. Uh, we have them for cultural understanding. Typically they're life size and you can actually converse with them either through text or voice. We have quite a portfolio of virtual humans. Um, as you can see here, this is most of them, although we've got a few new ones that haven't yet made it to this list. Um, I'm going to show a little bit about two virtual human girl guides that we made for the Boston Museum of Science on an NSF grant. Um, and these are guides that you can talk to, and they know a lot about the activities that are happening in the Connors Computer Place at the Museum of Science. And they also banter between themselves, and they, they you know, have a little bit of a personal life they can talk about. So if we can play that video. And there should be sound. So she said hello. Can we get the sound? I think we're going for the sound. Uh, we still don't have sound. Um, so I will say that we made these virtual humans um, in the light stage that Paul DeBevic has at the Institute. Uh, we did a lot of work bringing in a model that um, people had voted on as being uh, one that they thought was uh, compelling. And then we recorded Here. the voice. Here at Computer Place, you can command a robot to do a Mars mission and program another one at Robot Park. You can remote control a robot soldier or figure out how robots climb walls. You can even make a robotic dog dance or use one to navigate a virtual world. And don't forget the one that remembers meeting you. What do you want to do first? How do you understand what people are saying? We're virtual humans. We use speech recognition technology to identify your words and then and use statistics to figure out the meaning of the words based on context. Once we know what you're talking about, we'll reply appropriately. The same way you ask a question or tell a story to your friends is the same way you can speak to us. As long as we're speaking the same language, we can speak it naturally. Like you could ask, where's Robot Park? Or could you tell me where Robot Park is? Both are looking for the same answer. How did you get your names? Our namesakes are Ada Lovelace and Grace Hopper. Yeah, they may be old-fashioned names, but both are from the most modern computing women of their time. In the 1800s, Ada Lovelace predicted that computers would someday help us write music and create art. And in this past century, Grace Hopper created a type of computer program called a compiler, which helps people tell computers what to do. It could be said that 
Ada inspired Grace. Or that Grace did all the work, in which case our names are perfect. Do you have boyfriends? Why? Is there another virtual human you think we should meet? I hope they're into neural networks and amino acid sequences. Grace, what's wrong with just charming and generous? So you can see they have different personalities. Okay, that's all. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for coming by. Have a great time with all the exhibits at Computer Place. So these have been running since um, December of last year at the Computer Place, so they've interacted with thousands of kids. and. Uh, they're very big when you come in. They're life-size, they're in a kiosk, and um, it sort of stops everybody in their tracks. So that's an example of the virtual humans that we're, we're doing um, out in the world. Now, another area that we're looking at, whoops, so that's back. Is there no laser pointer on here? Um, this chart shows the usage of virtual worlds. Virtual worlds, as opposed to virtual reality, are persistent um, spaces that are typically inhabited by a lot of people at the same time. So they're not these sort of one-off things that are used for specific purposes. And as you can see from this chart, which is probably hard to read, but go to the K0 site and really, really look at, look at it. The quadrants are age groups. So the first quadrant is ages 5 to 10. And all of those red dots are virtual worlds built just for that age group. And then the next one is ages 10 to 15. And then the next is 15 to 25. So you can see all of the virtual worlds that are coming up for young kids. Now, the last quadrant is age 25 to death, I guess. And there are very few there, but there are some, like Second Life um, and Blue Mars and a few others that are um, used by all ages, shall we say. Now, the purpose of putting this slide up is to say that we are having, um, we are raising a whole generation of kids who are going to expect things to be delivered through virtual worlds. This is going to be a standard thing. Like, we are really good at the web. They're going to be good at, at uh, acting and finding information in 3D immersive environments. Um, so, as I said, they are persistent, networked, and you inhabit them with an avatar, typically an avatar that you've designed and chosen. So it's, an, it's a virtual representation of yourself that you can actually find some bond with and get connected to. Um, we, are primary so, we, we are primarily social creatures and virtual worlds are primarily social. And the point I want to make here is that social immersion is a very special kind of immersion that humans are well adapted to. It's the kind of immersion that we respond most to. So virtual environments, um, virtual reality, that tends to be a spatial immersion. But when you get people in the mix, then you, you're bringing in this social immersion. So a little bit more about avatars. A lot of the virtual worlds uh, that have avatars, these avatars are a key attractor for the people that go there because it's a way for you to present a face in an, in an environment that is exactly what you want to present. So it doesn't matter what you're like in the real world. If you want to put out what's inside you, then an avatar is a way to do that. And people become very, very um, identified with their avatars. And other social networks that we have, like Facebook and LinkedIn and those, do not provide this means for embodied self-expression. So now I want to talk about a little project that we've been working on for a year or so at the ICT, and that's called Coming Home. This is a project that happens in the virtual world that is designed to provide veterans coming back from the wars a way to gently get help for the mental health issues that they're having. So we have this big problem that people coming back don't go after, go, don't go after mental health help. Um, it could be because they're in rural areas. Most of the vets do live in rural areas, so they don't have access. There's a stigma attached to getting that help. Um, they may not even know they need help because it takes six months for many of these issues to manifest. So even those that go don't complete their treatment. And virtual worlds can address these things in many ways. Um, they have anonymity and peer support, and we can put activities in the virtual world that can help them. So Coming Home built a space, and it's a very relaxing space. It has a lodge. It has access to different um, 
websites that have uh, resources for the veterans. But the important thing that we're doing there is we're providing them with relaxation techniques like mindfulness-based stress reduction. So we have actually translated the physical world mindfulness classes to the virtual world, and we have started holding classes with uh, expert mindfulness practitioners and veterans. Now, one of the reasons virtual worlds are so important and why avatars are a key aspect of them is this concept of the Proteus effect. Now, this was uh, first defined at Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab. And basically, it's what you see your avatar doing actually has an effect on your behavior in the physical world long after you've left the virtual world. So there's a couple studies that uh, I suggest you read if you're interested in this. We wanted to go a little farther than just having people watch their avatar do something in the virtual world. And so one of the things we came up with was a virtual jogging path. Rather than just press the button and watch your avatar run, you control that avatar with your breath on an ordinary microphone. So there's no special equipment. You have a microphone to do the voice chat in the world anyway. And if you can breathe into the microphone in a regular relaxed way, your avatar will run this jogging path. Now, beyond that, we have put our virtual humans into the virtual world. Uh, we've started with Second Life. We've also done a couple of other virtual worlds. Uh, they serve many purposes. They serve as 24-7 guides. So when you pop into that space, this guide uh, that we have here named Info will come up and greet you. He remembers you. He can take you on a navigational tour of that space, um, and he can take you wherever you want to go. So he's got all the information. Now, it was quite a challenge to take our technology from virtual humans and put them into this persistent online environment, but um, we managed to do it. Here's a picture of Info interacting with um, a visitor. Right now, it's text, so you type your um, queries to Info, and he types back. Um, another virtual human that we're doing is part of a storytelling activity for veterans called the Warrior's Journey, and this is designed to have classic warrior stories throughout uh, history that embody the kinds of core ideals that a soldier would have. Um, so the power of story is great, and if we can get people to think about the positive aspects of being a warrior, the duty, the, the um, dedication, that type of thing, then we can help them rewrite their own personal story so that it's a more positive thing. Um, I think now we've got the next video, so I'm gonna show you uh, next a video of someone going through this experience. We put it in a tower. Um, you can walk into this tower and you will see a choice of several um, classic warriors from history. So she's going in the tower and uh, there's the, the menu, Cheyenne Dog Warrior, Japanese Samurai, or True Heroes. And I'll talk about uh, the other two in a minute. We're gonna see the Cheyenne Dog Warrior. <laughs> When the dog rope was passed down to me, I became a part of a great tradition. So there are these panels in the, in the tower. So you see this. And when you get to the top... Um, I was a dog soldier, a warrior. Can we go ahead and cut the sound so I can talk over this? Thanks. So when you, but you can let it play. When we get to the top, you actually meet the 3D Cheyenne dog warrior. And you can ask the dog warrior questions about what he's talked about, these scenes from his life. You can um, ask him off-topic questions like, who's your daddy? He'll actually tell you who your daddy is um, or who his daddy is. And it's, a, it's an interactive experience that allows the participant to go deeper into the story and ask questions about uh, the elements that are important to them. So I want to just get to the top here where you can see the, the Cheyenne dog warrior. Now, he finishes the story with voice and says his comrades are buried here. But then you uh, are given a text thing that says you can now talk to the dog warrior. And then you start typing and you can stay there as long as you want. When you, I'm going to go to the next slide. When you um, finish, you leave the tower. You can go right back to the, the lobby and you can pick another story. Um, another story we're working on is the samurai warrior, and in that story, the samurai warrior is a calligrapher before he goes to war, but loses the use of his arm in an injury in the war, and uh, the story is about him uh, learning to use the other arm to do calligraphy. 
So it's about returning from injury. Can we have the slides back? The last selection that was on that menu is called True Heroes. And what we're doing beyond having a storytelling agent with which you can interact is to have a, um, a virtual human agent that actually helps you create your own warrior's journey story. So it will be a, a two-part agent. Part of the agent will be online so that you can upload videos and audio and images. And the virtual agent within the world will help you to, um, to create a story that then can be experienced by others in the warrior's journey tower. Uh, we are also working on voice recognition in the virtual world. This is a little bit harder uh, than we thought, so we're going to keep plugging away at it and see if we can get the virtual agents in the virtual world to understand as well as Ada and Grace do in the museum. Um, so I talked about the authoring of the story, and that's pretty much, um, well, I have one more slide, but we lost it. The last slide, here we go, is about collaborations. And we have a number of really exciting people who are interested in this work from either a medical standpoint, the veteran standpoint, or um, doing cool things. So again, like everybody else here, I invite you to come and brainstorm some ways to collaborate. Uh, if you need virtual humans for anything, or if you want to start thinking about uh, ideas that we could, imp we could improve them with, then we, we appreciate that, and we'd love to talk to you. Here you're talking about the virtual world. Mm -hmm. You have some issues then, and that is like you, you mentioned the AI. The uh, there's there's got to be some off-the-shelf tools that understand voice recognition, like a nuance and, and some of these true speech tools. Um, have you had the opportunity uh, to work with like a Microsoft that has you know uh, the Tell Me technology? Have they been open to donate a lot of their tools? We haven't worked with Microsoft, but we have worked with uh, some companies for the voice recognition. Uh, the bigger thing for us is getting the agents to respond mm -hmm. in in voice on the AI side. Then. So the yeah, so side. so you can record voices, but that makes them not very flexible mm -hmm. because then you're stuck with what you've recorded. You can use something called Searproc, where you've just recorded the phonemes and have those reconfigured quickly when a question is asked. Mm -hmm. um, but that still sounds a little machine. a little machine-like, right. better than most of the machine ones. So it's an ongoing research area. And if we want to see this, uh, where was, is there something in LA we could actually see some of this technology? The Institute for Creative Technologies has a monthly tour. So just uh, email, I think, tours at ict.usc.edu or go to the website, ict.usc.edu. And do you ever see maybe uh, Leisure Suit Larry and the Lone Loud Lizards coming back in 3D like that. I'm, I'm not sure. It kind of looked like that, right? Only for those people that go see Jackass 3D. There you go. Jacqueline, all right. Thank you very much. <laughs>